So the reason why we are here today to listen to the product road mapping guru. Trust me, there is no better person to teach product road mapping. As I said earlier on, I've watched several presentations, you know, of Jana speaking through product road mapping, product culture, you know, even had the privilege of using ProdPad which is a product um, road mapping tool that she co-founded. So it's a great privilege to have her here. And um, thank you so much, Jana, for honoring our invitation. Um, please, can we welcome Jana? Can we welcome ourselves? I want to see how um, Josh expressed herself in the chat section. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Jana. Welcome. I hope, you know, we are typing in the chat sections right now because I cannot see because I'm um, sharing <laughs> my screen, <laughs> sadly. All right, so over to you, Jana. Thank uh, you. Wonderful. So Thank you so much for the warm welcome, uh, Toby and everybody. Really good to be here. Really good to get a chance to chat with you about road mapping today. I was really thrilled when I got the invite. Uh, let me share my screen and uh, then we can get on with the presentation. Just give me one second to get it all set up and running how I like. Okay, great. So I'm presenting my screen now. Uh, can you see my screen? It says product road mapping done right. Yes, we can. Jenna. Okay, wonderful. All right, and uh, I just wanted to try a little experiment and see if it'll pick up on captions as well. Oh, look at it go. It's doing that. So you should be able to see the captions as well. All right. So <laughs> accessibility for the win. <laughs> right. So let's talk about um, product road mapping. So Toby, you already did a wonderful job of introdu introducing me. So thank you for that. Um, here's how you can contact me. I'm uh, easiest to find on Twitter. I'm simply Basto. My DMs are open. So you can always just come find me on Twitter or connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, reach out to me and say hello. I'd always love to chat with fellow product people. Uh, as Toby said, I'm one of the founders of Mind the Product, which is a huge global community and series of events and training for product managers. Um, so if you're um, interested in that, get involved and come meet the, the wider global community. And I'm also one of the founders of ProdPad, which is a, a tool for product managers. And it started because I was a product manager originally and I needed tools to do my own job and nothing really existed. So I started building something and turns out other people wanted this as well. So it's now used by thousands of companies around the world to manage their products. It allows teams to gather insights and suggestions and feedback and prioritize product changes on the roadmap. So it connects to other tools like Jira, Trello, Slack, and many others that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, so by all means, give it a try. We have a free trial. Um, I'd love to chat with anybody later uh, and get your feedback on it as well, because I'm a product person at heart and I would love to find out um, how these sort of things are working. Now, we can't talk about product road mapping without talking about product culture, because it's the product culture that actually helps you understand um, what goes on to your roadmap and how your roadmap is actually formed. So let's start with that. Now, I don't mean foosballs, tables and beer fridges and that sort of thing. It's about how your team operates, even without explicit instructions. And culture is super important because it shapes the potential your company has in the long run. So let's look at companies, uh, sorry, uh, elements of good company culture. Uh, and I like to break it down into these three elements. Um, having alignment, giving clear direction to your team, uh, having a North Star metric or objective that everyone is pointed at and, and is, is heading towards. Followed by autonomy, giving your team the space to work their magic. You've hired people who are great at their particular skills. Uh, let them find their own path through to, to solve problems. And you can really see how alignment and autonomy can come together. I love this uh, chart by Henrik Nyberg. If you ever get a chance to read some of his other stuff, he uh, has a great way of describing this stuff visually. And I really like how he points out how teams with high autonomy and high alignment are the ones with uh, a collaborative culture and are able to innovate. So that's really important to a good product culture. 
But it's not as important, or it, all of this is for nothing if you don't have psychological safety. For good culture to succeed, you need to build psychological safety. It's about pe making people feel more comfortable speaking up and reporting errors and pitching in to help with the product. So one way that you can actually start building this into your team, uh, you know, is to, to, to just think about small changes in your behavior and in your language. And there's a lot more behind this, um, and I'm not going to talk about this forever, uh, but it does help to remember that it's not your job as the product manager to have all the answers. You're supposed to know less than your colleagues. Instead, it's your job to focus on asking the best questions and creating a safe space for everyone to contribute. And you can do that. One of the things you can do is change some of your language to focus on some new terms. Uh, so one of my favorite questions is to, to phrase questions so they begin with, how might we? It turns issues into a collective problem. It supposes instead of asserts. And it works really well in conjunction with I bet. See, as a product manager, you're going to be wrong a lot. I bet gives you permission to fail and to, to try again. After all, it wasn't you that was wrong. It was your hypothesis. And now that you know what doesn't work, you're free to test the next bet. So it's subtle, but these shifts in language set the stage for psychological safety in your team. And so here's a, a formula <laughs> that I've come up with. Now take this loosely, because you're not going to be able to calculate this or anything like that. Uh, but what I like about this is that it, it shows that alignment and autonomy are important and additive, uh, while psychological safety is almost a multiplication factor. So really important to build that psychological safety. But you do need that alignment and autonomy, otherwise people will be just heading off into the wrong direction. So how does the roadmap help with this? The roadmap actually tells you more than you actually think. I see the roadmap as a diagnostic tool. I can tell what dysfunctions a company has just by looking at their roadmap. Uh, I, I run things called roadmap clinics, essentially you know, free um, troubleshooting sessions to talk about uh, how people's roadmaps are working for them and what kind of objections they're running into, what kind of problems they're running into. And I actually think that the roadmap can be a diagnostic tool for the state of a company and that a bad roadmap is symptoms is a symptom of an underlying issue in that company. So a couple examples of that. If your roadmap has a whole bunch of features and solutions, not problems to be solved, it means that your team doesn't really have that lack of it doesn't means it means that your team doesn't really have the autonomy that they need it means that you're dictating to them exactly what it is that they're supposed to go build and when and not really giving them the space to uh, work out the best way to solve these problems. Another symptom might be completely missing your roadmap or vision. Some companies go without a roadmap or nothing tied back to the company level objectives as if it's sort of standing alone. And this is a sign of a lack of alignment in the company, a team that doesn't actually know what their North Star is and where they're supposed to be headed. And if the roadmap is dictated from above and there's no room for questions or experiments, this is often an indication of there being a lack of psychological safety within the team. And so the biggest offender that I see time and time again is the timeline roadmap. Now, I know this format makes you look great today. Your board and your bosses certainly love when you can give them this level of certainty, but it's setting you up for failure. See, if you deconstruct this format of the roadmap, you basically get a chart that maps out time versus things to do. You have time on the x-axis that creates this timeline. And at first, it seems pretty easy and intuitive to use, especially in the short term. But the further out you plan and the more you put on there, the harder it becomes to manage. And because that timeline sits at the top, always marching forward, no matter what you put on the roadmap, they always include a due date, due date and a time estimate just by the format of this roadmap. And as a result, you end up with a big pile of features, a big pile of deadlines, and it's all based on this big pile of assumptions that you've made. So the first assumption you've made with this format is that you know how long each of these is going to take. Now, this might be easy for the stuff that you've broken down into more detail and had the developers give estimates on, the really short-term stuff. 
But the further down the list you go, the further out you go, the less clarity you've actually got. You're also assuming that nothing else is going to come in and mess up your timeline. No new changes in the market, no new competitors, no fresh ideas coming from customers, no need for iteration. You're also assuming that each of these features is going to work as soon as they launch. So if you put three weeks to build that new checkout page, then at the end of Uh, someone's muted, Jenna. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Was I gone for a long time? <laughs> we can hear you now. All right. Okay, great. So the last assumption is that by explicitly adding these features to the timeline, you're assuming that each of these features should definitely exist, that they form part of the strategy and therefore should be codified. And at the end of the day, you're making one big dangerous assumption, and that's that nothing is going to change. And we work in the digital world, we work in the real world, and things do change all the time. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, you've got these made-up release dates that are forcing your developers on stressful marches to get everything out on time. Your sales and your customers and other people have these expectations of what you're going to build that you just can't meet anymore. Um, oftentimes, you're missing opportunities in the market and downright building the wrong things. And this leads to you being a sad product manager. And it gets worse because basically what happens, it creates this vicious cycle where you've got, you know, no one wants to be caught holding the hot potato, right? So they, they, they give bigger and uh, bigger buffers on their estimates. And so work ends up slowing down. Time expands to fill the work given and work ends up taking longer to actually create stuff. And therefore execs get less comfortable with giving the freedom to build in lean ways because they don't want to, uh, they don't want to see things slow down any further. So they try to tie down even more tight deadlines. So they feel like they have a control on costs and it creates this blame culture, which is basically the opposite of psychological safety. That blame culture then makes people feel like if they get it wrong, they're going to have to, um, provide bigger buffers so that they're not wrong on their estimates and things slow down even further. So it creates this vicious cycle of teams who end up moving slower and slower and slower and getting less and less happy and less and less productive. And one of the problems is, is that oftentimes while all of this is happening, you don't actually see this affecting the company numbers, right? You look at their numbers and this is for, you know, some of those jumbo companies out there and they're just moving up and to the right quarter on quarter. But the thing is, is that this is this is a trap because oftentimes you get these companies who are growing, but it's at negligible amounts. What they're not really seeing is that uh, there is a bigger hill. They're 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 optimizing towards a local map maxima, and they're not actually finding the bigger, more interesting problems to solve. In the long run, these companies are often doomed because smaller startups will end up taking over their growth. So they're optimizing for short-term consistent growth and they're leaving behind the option to be flexible and to solve new, more interesting problems in the future. So the industry ends up passing them by. They're, the best option they should be heading for will be at that true maximum, right? They need to be able to experiment to find their way there, but they're not able to get there. An example, take a look at what's happening in banking. Um, HSBC, uh, you know, multi-generational um, bank, uh, that has huge amount of business lines. Uh, it's them versus hundreds of different fintech startups who are nipping at their heels. So is there a better way? Well, of course there is. I want to implore you all to do this with me right now, which is if you have a timeline roadmap, let's ditch it. Ditch your timeline roadmap and move towards this lean format. So let me show you uh, how to do so in just four steps. So start with your vision. You can't have a good roadmap if you don't have a clear product vision. Uh, so if you don't have one of these agreed with the team, go back to the drawing board. Uh, so this is a format that I like using. You might recognize it from Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm book as an elevator pitch template, but it asks the right questions for product vision. Uh, who are you building for and what's going to set you apart? 
uh, use this template or something similar and then work with your team to wordsmith it into something that really jives with your team. This is actually something that gives you that alignment piece of your product culture. You need that, that North Star, you need that understanding as to where it is that you're heading. Map out your objectives. This is your next step. These should be outcome-based goals that are tied to your company strategy. Now you might know these as KPIs or OKRs, um, or like us, just simply call them objectives. It doesn't really matter what you call them, just use what works for you and for your team. Uh, your objectives act as guardrails. They help you understand uh, what the vision is meant to be broken down into and how you're going to get there. Uh, and it keeps everyone pointing in the right direction and working on the right things. They know as to whether they've gone above or below something because they know what they're being measured on. The important thing to do is to focus on outcome over output. Measuring output is like counting how many story points have been completed, whereas measuring outcomes means you're tying results back to the original company level goals. And finally, you can change out your timeline for time horizons. It's a subtle difference, but instead of that single line marching forwards, think in terms of these three buckets. So in your first bucket, you're, you're granular about your focus and your scope. This is the stuff that's being prototyped, tested, and built right now. The future, or the, the last column there, the later column, is, is less about specific initiatives, but more about around outlining the problems you think you need to be solved in order to fulfill your vision. They're, they're opportunities that are on the horizon. They're, they're, they're obstacles that you know that you're likely going to have to come up against. They're assumptions that need to be validated. And so this actually helps provide that autonomy because you're outlining the, the scope of the problems and giving people the guardrails and understanding as to how they're being measured so that people can actually figure out within their own teams, using their own skills, how they're going to go about solving those particular problems and in what order. Now, the larger a company gets, the more that experimentation gets stifled. You probably know this build, measure, learn diagram, and it seems pretty simple because it is simple. It's build, measure, learn. That is until you've got competition nipping at your heels, a growing base of customers asking for more and more, and tech debt creeping in at the edges, and your team starts to panic and shovel features and fixes out the door, and you end up just focusing on the build side of things and not so much on the measure or the learn side, and you end up with the build, build, build cycle. It's called the build trap. Uh, there's an entire book on this by Melissa Perry that I recommend. Um, and uh, it talks about how to recognize this and how to get out of this. Uh, very important to recognize if you've got a build trap roadmap, <laughs> a series of features and due dates and things like that. Now, one of the key things is I talked about the future column and, and, and using your, uh, your roadmap as a space to um, validate assumptions. This is how you can get out of that trap. You need to make space in your roadmap for work to be validated. It's not that people in your team don't understand that it's important to move the right metrics. It's often that they don't actually have the permission and the time to stop building and actually do the measurements, right? We're, we're constantly pushing people forward on this whole build this thing and the next sprint build these other things and the sprint after that build these other things. At what point do you take a break between sprints and say, did what we build last sprint actually make a difference? And it's a really subtle shift, but it's giving people that space, that, that, that reminder that they should go back. And validation is actually really important in your roadmap because I don't see the roadmap as a perfect plan. I see your roadmap as key in validation. I see your roadmap as a prototype for your strategy. So just as you might validate a feature by drawing up some paper prototypes and showing them to your customers and then starting again based on that feedback. So your first paper prototype is always terrible and that's okay. The, the value in prototyping isn't in the, the, the piece of paper. It's in the conversation and the learning that you're having as you're doing the prototyping. Um, likewise, the value isn't in your roadmap. That's something that you're gonna throw out time and time again. You're gonna flex it. You're gonna change it as you learn more. Your roadmap, 
is the starting point for a conversation. The value is in the, the road mapping process. So the roadmap basically starts off that conversation around what needs to be included in your strategy and allows you to validate and understand what problems do or don't exist uh, in front of you in, if you're following a particular uh, product vision. So let's put that all together and let's take a look at a lean roadmap. I've taken the, your vision, your objectives, your time horizons, and you get a lean roadmap. So each of the blocks that you see on here represents uh, an initiative or a problem to be solved or an opportunity that's on the horizon. And each is linked to a specific objective. So you can then see as to whether something is there to get you revenue or user growth or technical stability or whatever it is. So this is one way that you might configure it. Uh, and you can dive a little bit deeper on your roadmap and get more out of it. Because um, your roadmap can actually help you with the experimentation angle as well. So each card is tied to the problem to be solved and tied to an objective, but each card can then also be connected to a list of experiments that could be run in order to solve that problem and impact that objective. So you're using your roadmap to give you an overview of progress on ongoing experiments and also to sense check that you've got enough different ways, enough different experiments to try in order to solve each problem. You certainly don't want to just have one problem with one experiment, you want multiple experiments, multiple things to try, because some of your experiments are going to fail. Um, and this is why you want to say, I bet we could try doing this to solve this problem. That might be wrong. I bet we could try this in order to try this problem. And you should have your team members all pitch in on what these experiments might be, help you prioritize them and figure out which ones might be most likely to succeed, uh, and um, allow you to show that progress and understand as to how your experiments are actually making a difference to the problems that you're trying to solve. So once a project is done in development, don't just throw out these results or tuck them away somewhere that you'll never find again. I see a bad habit all the time. You release something, so you close all the tickets in JIRA, you crumple up all the sticky notes on the wall, wipe down your whiteboard, and you start moving on to the next thing, which might seem good for keeping up an agile cadence, but it's really bad for making sure that you're actually making an impact. After all, just because something was launched doesn't mean it's actually solved the problem you wanted it to. So your roadmap can actually help you here as well. Instead of deleting cards off your roadmap, move them to a list of completed cards, some sort of validation roadmap. And the purpose here is to give you a space, that space and time that I was talking about earlier to remind you to do this stuff, um, gives you that space to track what was released and when, and then outline the actual results. Did it solve the problem and move the metric you were hoping it would, or did it end up failing? So by building this validation into your roadmap, you create a space to show the value of the work done. So this is where the experimentation and validation can make a big difference, is creating that space for that psychological safety. It's creating that, uh, that psychological safety within your team so that people can feel like they can add their experiments and have the space and time to validate what their, that the work is actually valuable. And the other thing that you're doing with the Lean Roadmap is that it's taking the focus off building features and hitting delivery dates, which are just arbitrary things, and instead helps your team strive towards solving actual problems. Now, I know that a lot of people start asking at this point in time, what if I actually have to give delivery dates? <laughs> because not everyone can get away without any delivery dates, right? Let's, let's bring this back to the real world. Um, let's talk about why dates sometimes can be on the roadmap. I mean, you know, I'm based here in the UK. Um, and, you know, a couple of years ago, we had GDPR as a, as a thing, and everyone had GDPR on the roadmap. It was just something you had to do. Um, sometimes there are other milestones that have to be communicated. If you're working in education, you need to have something ready by the time schools reopen. Um, if you're working in um, uh, e-commerce, then, you know, if you don't have something ready in time for the Christmas rush, then you're in trouble, right? So there, there are sometimes strategically important initiatives, and they have to be communicated against a date. 
Now, keep in mind that the roadmap is a strategic communication document. And so if part of the strategy is to remain legal by a specific date or to get your product out by a specific date, then so be it. The roadmap should be used to communicate dates in these cases. But the ongoing problem we have is that people put timelines at the top of the roadmap and map out the, part, the, the items underneath it. And it turns in, into a completely date-driven roadmap where everything that sits underneath is given a due date, just arbitrarily, just because you had that timeline at the top. And it gives the impression that you're promising all of the features on the roadmap by their associated dates. Now, some companies work in more uh, regulated spaces than others. If you're trying to break into the banking space, you're going to have more regulatory dates and legal things that you have to hit, which means that you're going to have to add that buffer. And by comparison, you're going to have to move slower. It's simple as that. You're not able to be as nimble and lean if you're working in heavily um, regulated, slow moving spaces. The more lean you're able to be, the less reliant on dates you're able to be, the more nimble you're able to be, the more flexible you're able to be. You're able to change your product based on what's happening in the market. So if you're making commitments way ahead of time for everything you do, you're not going to be able to make those changes. If you're only committing to like, you know, 10% of your things, then you can be pretty flexible, right? Um, if you are committing to like 80% of your things, you're not going to be very flexible at all. Some companies just by the format of the roadmap, accidentally make sure that they're promising 100% of their things and have no flexibility. And that's a really bad idea. So try to build in as much flexibility as you can for your team, even if you do sometimes have a strategically important date. Um, so some good examples of uh, dates that you might have to run towards, GDPR, like legal compliance or uh, a market opportunity, something strategically important and externally driven. Bad reasons, if your bosses just think they should expect it, right? I see, uh, I see too many teams where their bosses just sort of say, I want to know when this is going to be out because they just want that sense of control but it's actually not helping the team. It's not building good psychological safety. Um, and it should be something that you should be able to push back on and say, well, actually, we'll deliver the best version of the product um, rather than trying to get something out specifically on time just because you've come up with the date. Um, if you can paint a clear picture of the strategic steps you think are necessary and back it up with res research and give strong reasoning for the priority, then actual delivery dates start mattering less. What your bosses really want is to know that you are helping them spend their resources in the most effective way. And that means that you're not spending time on the wrong stuff. You are always focusing on the most important problems to be solved. Uh, other format, uh, sorry, other um, re bad reason is because your roadmap format implies it. If you have a timeline at the top, and it just sort of tells you that everything underneath there has a date, that's a very bad reason to just work towards dates. So I recommend ditching that timeline roadmap, um, the, the timeline from the top of your roadmap, and instead just looking at the order of the problems that you want to solve, uh, mapping it out. If you need the time, use the time horizons so people have an idea as to how far away things are. Uh, but um, you know, don't taint your entire roadmap with date-driven everything just because you sometimes have to work to dates. Um, Jason Knight has just put a great comment in there. Um, see also arbitrary quarterly planning and deadlines. You know, like who said that a quarter is the perfect amount of time for something? Um, who said that a year is the perfect amount of time for things, right? Um, I think it's really important that people start thinking about how you best spend your time now and stop trying to make things fit within, um, within magical deadlines. It never quite works. I've never seen anybody actually finish a roadmap that they set out the year before. Um, and I think one of the worst reasons to put dates on your roadmap is because you think it'll focus the team and speed them up. Um, this is actually the opposite. If you force your team to commit to dates, they'll add buffer, which slows everything down, work expands to fill the time. They start feeling like they're going to slip on dates, so they actually have to end up carve, they end up carving out either scope or quality. As a product manager, you see when they carve out scope, it means they're not building all the features you asked for. You don't see when they're carving out quality. You don't see that they didn't comment the code very well. You didn't see that they um, didn't use the slightly better version that they could have done had they worked on it just a couple extra days. 
this is where your tech debt is coming from, right? By forcing your team to work in this uh, arbitrary towards arbitrary deadlines is forcing them to um, f f rush their work out and often means that quality just goes out the door. So ask yourself if you're ever tempted to commit to a date, what's driving this? What are we willing to sacrifice for this? And is it strategically important? Is it something that we have to work to or is it something that we should actually leave flexible in case something changes this year? Have a think, what kind of, what kind of organization do you wanna operate as? So I like thinking about companies on this scale of nimble and lean and super slow and risk averse. Um, few companies are on the either extreme of this scale. Most fall somewhere in the middle. But the best are those who find some sort of dual track approach, right? They they keep their cash cow product, but find a way to be nimble with a less risky subset of resources. Uh, some companies operate entirely based on dates. Some companies make their money by selling their time on projects, and there's no shame in this. They're called agencies. And unfortunately, agencies don't change the world. They sell their time. They're not creating massive amounts of value. Companies that change the world are those that sell on value. Product companies are the companies that change the world. So this is why I recommend ditching the timeline roadmap, adopting leaner ways of working, uh, and finding ways that your company can actually help change the world using your roadmap. I'm happy to take questions and uh, to guide people through. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, feel free to connect with me. As I said, I'm easy to reach. I'm Simply Basto on Twitter. Uh, I'm Jana at prodpad.com. Uh, let's go for a virtual coffee or beer or whatever and um, let's connect. Okay, thank you so much, Jana. That was really insightful. I particularly like that you tackled the what if a date is requested from you in your organization. So how do you handle that? My check, can everyone hear me? Uh, it's a little fuzzy. Oh, my check, is this better? Getting a little bit of feedback on it. My check. I can hear you. I can hear yeah. you, Toby. Yeah, okay. it's okay. Cool. So, so I was saying that, Jana, thank you very much for this insightful session. I said I particularly like that you undo the part, you know, when mm -hmm. your your organization expects that you put dates to your roadmap. <laughs> and then I love the last slide actually did a screenshot where you said that you know it's product-led organizations that actually change the world <laughs> i think that was really cool um so now is the time for questions i will be looking through the chat section and jana will be here to answer our questions can everyone hear me yeah all right okay yeah. yeah okay so i'm checking the chat section now so please if you have questions i wanted us to have enough time you know to answer questions so please put your questions in the chat section this session would only be for 10 minutes the question and answer um question and answers um so we have a question here jana there's a question here that says how do you handle roadmaps for B2B products? Uh, really, good well, question. really good question. So how do you handle roadmaps for B2B products? Um, to be honest, um, same way that you'd handle it for just about any other product. You know, uh, you are solving problems for, um, you're solving problems. And you, what your roadmap is meant to do is outline the order in which you're tackling those problems. Uh, and so that doesn't necessarily change between B2B versus B2C or other uh, variations. Um, what uh, does change is perhaps how you present it. So if you are um, in B2C world, you might have a public facing roadmap that um, you, know, you, you show to a lot of people and you get lots and lots and lots and lots of feedback on. Um, and therefore you end up um, trying to uh, 
figure out um, you know, how to work with a huge group of people. I definitely recommend not going down the path of turning uh, your roadmap into a voting portal um, and having people like vote up or down which features they want. Um, that's not building a roadmap. You know, that's just listening to the squeakiest wheel. Um, with B2B, um, you tend to actually end up getting less feedback, but oftentimes it ends up being more um, more valuable to your company because it's, you know, these other companies are telling you, um, you know, what would make them spend thousands more with you. Um, and so you sometimes have versions of your roadmap that you share with, um, not publicly publicly, but with your customers, which is a pretty common setup. Um, and sometimes full on publicly as well, depending on how you want to um, set that up. Um, but um, same thing goes. Uh, I think it's really important that when you're in B2B space or any space, um, you're not selling your roadmap. You're not selling this future promise of things to build. You're selling the service and the product that you have today. And you're using the roadmap to help you understand as to what kind of future problems you could possibly solve for people. Um, so never use your roadmap as a sales tool saying, sign up today and here's what we're going to build in the next quarter because you won't build it and then it'll all look bad on you as the product manager. I know this speaking from experience, having tried to build a roadmap in that way. Um, so instead, use your roadmap as a tool to uh, gather feedback and make sure that the product that you are envisioning in the future is in fact still going to be useful for the, the customers and the market that you're, that you're aiming for. Okay, so thank you for that. Busayo, I hope that was helpful. Okay, so we move on to the next question by Jackin. Okay, so there's a question from Mafford CB. So the question is how to formulate and present what's inside the cards. Is it like user stories? Ah, such a good question. Okay, so um, the the cards themselves are basically, I mean, in ProdPad, uh, we just have them as open text fields. You can write whatever you want in there. Generally speaking, it should include a scope of the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, it should include um measurement metrics so we link to the objective but you might also have other things that you're measuring um you might include um other pieces that are important to communicate alongside that initiative and so this is where it actually gets um really interesting and very freeing with the the lean roadmap the the old school version of road mapping basically forces you to just outline things almost like data entry you know objects on a road map in a line Whereas the lean roadmap is a communication document. Think of it as a text document. It's something that you should be able to show to a human and they should be able to read it, right? A stakeholder, your boss or a team member, they should be able to read this roadmap and more or less understand what the key initiatives are, what order you're going to tackle them on and what sort of problems or objections or other things that they might be running into that they need to know about. So if there's information that you need to include in there, include it. If there's, um, you know, you don't want to make this huge, massively wordy document that no one's ever going to get through, um, nor do you want to obscure this information. So as much you want to include in that card as much information as necessary to communicate effectively to your stakeholders. And that depends on how informed your stakeholders are and how much information you need to give them. Typically speaking, the stuff that's in the near term and the now column tend to be more detailed because you know more about those problems than the things in the later column, which often end up being sort of like a one liner outlining a problem that you're kind of seeing on the horizon, but you know, isn't obviously detailed out in as much detail as the other cards. All right. Okay. Thank you, Jana, for that. So we move on to the next question. This is from Claire. So our question is how do you how do one okay how do you handle roadmaps that have been cascaded from top management with timelines and priorities so that's a really tough one because sometimes you end up in a company where the way that they always do it is uh timeline driven um and it can be very very difficult to get away from companies are 
more and more realizing that their old school way of working is slowing them down and you're starting to see companies make that shift. Um, other companies still need to make that shift. Now, if you are in a senior management, then you can start helping them make that shift much more rapidly. If you're not in senior management, then you sometimes have a, a tougher conversation in front of you. Now, as a product manager, your role is managing stakeholders and oftentimes stakeholders that never report to you. So it sort of depends on who those stakeholders are and you know what their um, uh, what their attitude is towards this timeline roadmap and versus the lean roadmap. Um, sometimes you can actually just get away with changing it, right? Just show them the lean roadmap, bring that to the next board meeting. Um, you know how they say forgiveness is easier than permission. You might actually just get away with it. I've seen literally hundreds of product managers do this and be just fine. Other times they'll come back and say, no, we want the dates, we want this. Um, and then it becomes a, a period of figuring out um, why they want those dates and how you can actually react to those. Is it that they think that without the timeline, it means that nothing will ever work to a date? Are they afraid that um, without uh, giving set deadlines, the developers will just sit on their thumbs and not work? Um, you know, what are their fears and how can you convince them? Uh, and there's a number of different things that might be coming out there. Um, I think the most powerful thing you can do is talk to them about the risk that they are taking as a company by not allowing flexibility into the roadmap. By forcing you to work in inflexible ways, you are risking building the wrong things. You're risking wasting their team's money and all their resources on building the wrong things and setting expectations for stuff that's never going to happen. And when you start talking to them about risk and how they're spending their money and how they're going to get less return because of their way of working versus your way of working, um, you know, that can actually start shifting things. Um, I've written an article that I put on Mind the Product, which actually handles a number of uh, common objections that you might run into, reasons why your company may still want to hang on to its timeline roadmaps, um, and things that you can use to negotiate your way back to a lean position, if that helps. I'll be happy to send that around later. Okay. Thank you. That would be very helpful. And I'm going to remind you about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so there is a question from Eiaro Bumi. The question is, if there, if there are no dates, deadline, or no roadmap, how will the team become conscious of getting the products ready? Oh, such a good question. It's one of my favorites. Because the thing is, if you're working with the team, and they are seeing that they have the ability to solve problems for customers, they will put the work in to do stuff. The, 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 the whole concept of giving people scary deadlines in order to get work done is not what motivates people to do work. That's not what drives them. Um, you know, at ProdPad, we don't have deadlines. We don't have due dates for work going out. Uh, we've taken all the pressure off deadlines and instead, um, we separate things out like we have a soft launch that's vastly different than our hard launch. So we never have marketing or sales breathing down developers' necks asking for stuff. And yet the developers get things out faster than I could ever imagine because they've built in a great release process. They're not afraid of releasing. Um, I think that's a really key piece to, um, uh, to being able to move fast is making releases and the whole coding process um, straightforward. Um, and the developers actually get to take turns telling the customers about the great stuff that they've just built. And so whoever it is, like if you're building something and you're holding on to it and taking forever building it, it means that no one's ever going to see your work, right? The, 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 the drive to build something good is in the building it well and getting it out there and seeing somebody say, this is really lovely. Thank you for building something. So we make sure that the customers are able to see the work that the developers are putting into it. Um, and that the developers are able to see how much the customers respond. They're able to see the metrics move. They're able to see the customers smile and respond and, and love the products that they're building. And that is the motivation. Um, we've taken away the, um, the, the stick um, and instead sort of provide a, you know, um, a, a, a much friendlier way of motivating people to, to go build stuff. <laughs> Okay, so we have five more minutes in this question and answer session. The next question is from Tomin Singh Agbaje. 
what is the best way of creating a roadmap if you are moving away from feature driven roadmaps to problem solving roadmap what's the best way to create like what, what, what is the best way of creating a roadmap if we are moving from feature driven roadmap to problem solving roadmap <laughs> um, I mean, my bias is showing here. Uh, Prodpad provides a great template. Um, but to be honest, um, you know what? The best way to start is just to start from scratch with some post it notes and just start really simply. Because as I said, your roadmap is a prototype. And so, what you should be doing as a product manager is looking around at all the different pieces of information you have, talking to the experts around you. As I said, it's not your job to have all the answers, it's your job to ask the questions. So find out from key people around you, um, what does the market expect? What are the opportunities? What's technically possible? What are the big problems? And write down those problems on post-it notes, right? One problem, one initiative per post-it note, and then stick them in order that you think they are, right? Just make some assumptions there, and then use that set of post-it notes to check those assumptions. So show those post-it notes to somebody else on your team and say, based on everything I've learned for about this company and the, the opportunities in front of us, I think this is the order we need to go in. And that person might look at it and say, huh, that's slightly different than I expected. I would have said this is first and that's last and that goes in the middle. And you go, okay, well, let's change that around. Right? You might want to go and take it. Uh, uh, you might want to um, take the time to um, show it to multiple people in your team, show it to people, um, uh, customers even, right? Just sort of use this very basic version of your roadmap to check your assumptions about the problems in front of you. And then over time, you know, those post-it notes aren't going to hold all your information because you're going to start wanting to add tags and um, objectives and colors and be able to link your um, experiments to them and do lots more with them. So that's when you might want to move it to a tool like Broadpad that can handle that. But to start with, start with paper, start with a whiteboard, start with post-it notes, simplest tool we have. And as I said, the value is in the conversation you're having. It's not in the, the roadmap itself. You're going to throw the roadmap out time and time again. Hmm. Wow, the value is in the conversation and not the roadmap itself. I love it. So there's a question from Nav Rajiv. Are there frameworks, templates for following the Lean Roadmap? Um, are there templates for following it? Um, yes. I mean, I showed you a, an example of one. Um, there are articles written about it. Um, you often see the Lean Roadmap called the Now, Next, Later Roadmap. Um, you know, roadmapping is sort of a a newer space, it's changing a lot. And so I don't think we've really got the terminology down. I saw somebody else mention that they'd never heard of lean product roadmap and that's okay, that's because I made it up. Um, but it is using lean pros principles applied to road mapping. Um, and so um, there's not tons out there, but you will see more and more people adopting this sort of time horizon format um, or just different ways of doing it. And if you come up with a different format that works for your stakeholders, um, that that provides the alignment, provides the autonomy, gives people guidance on the problems that you're solving, um, you know, makes it clear as to how you're solving those problems, what experiments you're running, um, then you come up with your own template that works for your team. Um, that's absolutely fine as well. At the end of the day, the roadmap is just a communication document and whatever format you need to communicate that, then you can use. Okay, thank you, Jana. So we move on to the next question would only be able to take three more questions that is a for question so there's a question from Pope Atogi if there are no timelines to building products and clients have set aside a product launch in let's say six months knowing fully well that the product's functionality is dependent on several channels to complete their own part of the project how do we build a balance so this is a really, this is sort of a trick question um, because what you've actually got here is something that's already been sort of pre-sold. Um, unfortunately, if you've already told somebody and you've got this contract saying you have to have something out in six months time, then you need to do the project management work. Somebody in the company needs to do the project management work to uh, hopefully deliver that and achieve the goals of that project. Um, now, the thing is, is that the company could do this time and time again. You know, they could sell the next six months of time and the next six months of time after that. 
which is not a bad way of making money, but it's an agency. You're selling your time for money. The company who's doing this is not going to be able to react to changes in the market. They're not going to be product led. So, you know, you might want to say, let's finish this one project and get it out the door. And then we become more lean. Maybe you say it's only this one project and that only represents 10% of our work. So the rest of our 90% of work is flexible. So if something changes, we've still got a lot of capacity to, to do something. The problem comes is when your team, when your company is essentially selling all of your time off to go do projects that may or may not be the right thing, may or may not be solving the best, chunkiest problems out there. Okay, so the next question from Olufisayo, would you advise having specialized roadmaps for product sub teams, which could be excerpts from a high level roadmap? I find that sometimes sub teams could get overwhelmed with too much information. Yeah, um, another really great question. So remember that the roadmap is meant to be a communication document. So if you need to communicate more for a particular team or less for a particular team, adjust the roadmap, adjust your template to allow for that. Um, you know, uh, it, like in ProdPad, we have the ability to see multiple roadmaps together, but then see a condensed view of that because no one wants to see 20 pages, 20 scrolls worth of stuff. Um, you know, if, it, if it's more than a page or two of information, no one's going to actually read it and understand it. Um, if you want to go down even deeper, then you can add more detail to cards. Um, you know, you can add as much detail as that particular stakeholder needs. Um, and there's nothing wrong with adding annotations or explanations around your roadmap if it's needed. Remember, your role as a product manager is to communicate. You're a storyteller. Um, if there's teams who, you know, need that extra help to, to do their job, then that's what you can do. You can use your roadmap as one piece of that, but it's not everything that you're going to do to communicate. You can't just make your roadmap and run away. You still have to carve it out for the right stakeholders and, and communicate it in a way that makes sense to them. Mm. Okay, cool. And so to the very last question of today, because of time, which is from Kiran Saib, any tips for building roadmaps for non-tech services? Uh, yeah, um, to be honest, building roadmaps for non-tech services is actually not that different than building for tech services. Um, at the end of the day, you're outlining the um, problems that you're looking to solve or the initiatives that you're looking to tackle, the opportunities in front of you. Um, the um, experiments that you're running don't necessarily have to be based on tech. They could be surveys that you run. They could be um, uh, uh, different types of um, uh, methods for research that are aimed at testing services rather than um, tech um, or things that are um, used uh, that are that are better suited to testing hardware rather than digital, for example. Um, but the, the essence of it is essentially the same thing. Um, sometimes just the terminology that you use on the roadmap ends up changing. All right. Okay. So that would be all for questions today. Jana, please can you stop sharing your screen so I can see everyone's face. If you can turn um, your videos on, you would love it. So you can take a picture and then you can all say our bye. Excellent. <laughs> Let's see our faces so we oh, can okay. say goodbye. Oh. And we can take a picture. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take a picture now. This happened. My system just switched. Oops. Okay. Um, Grace, Grace, are you on the call? Uh, Busaya, can you help take a picture from your end? Um, yes, I am. Okay, cool. So, can we all smile now? <laughs> um, Beatrice, I'm not sure why you're presenting. Okay. Busaya, are you done? Yes? All right. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining today's session. Please remember to follow us on 
social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Product Dive. And if you have any questions, please feel free to shut us an email. Can everyone hear me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So it's seven on the dot. Thank you all once again for joining and see you in the next. Bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Wonderful chatting with you. Bye. 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 Thank you.